from a biblical perspective, we're going to be talking about peace. Well, how best to have peace unless we're completely surrendered? And I'm going to caveat this whole message. You guys are really going to have to put your seatbelts on because what we're going to be talking about, the first three quarters of this message is all about what peace is not. And then you're going to be like, wow, we are way off topic here. But I, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to beg you, you got to stick with me because there is good news at the end of the story. But the first part of this is pretty heavy, and I'm going to just ask that you just got to deal with it for a little bit. So if you'd open your Bibles to Psalms chapter 2, Psalms chapter 2 is a lovely, lovely passage of Scripture. And according to Acts, the, the author of Psalms chapter 2 is none other than King David. We talked a little bit about David last week, man after God's own heart, super cool pillar of spiritual awesomeness, right? Never mind that he committed adultery and murder and all that. That aside, David was a pretty solid king. And today what we're going to do is we're going to look at Psalms chapter 2. Now Psalms chapter 2 is pretty cool. It's broken down into equal sections, four equal sections. And that actually served into your sermon guide. So if you have your sermon guides, I'm not big into nerding out about notes. But if that's you, God bless you. Write lots. I left lots of space and lots of questions afterwards. But what we're going to do today is we're going to talk specifically at the first part, what peace is not. And I tend to gravitate to this because it means a ton to me because I'm a guy that probably doesn't have a lot of peace in his life at times. I feel like I'm always warring against something. And so this message is more probably for me than it is for you, but you get a chance to be at the end of the mic and, and listen. So here we go. Psalms chapter 2, King David writing. David says, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, let us burst their bonds and cast away their cords from us. Now, we're only going to take that first section at first because part point number one on your sermon guide is here we go. You ready to fill it in? Our sin nature causes us to conspire against God. Wow, those are big, 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 big words, right? Conspire. It causes us to actually be at odds with God. So the first three verses in Psalms describe a completely ridiculous concept to me. How long of arms would I have to have to fight God? It... That was compliments of Vodi Bauckham. He actually said that. I laughed hysterically. How do you fight God? That blows my mind. How is it that these people can actually get to the point where they're so deluded that they're going to fight God? It's not like I can call them on the phone and say, I'm mad at you. Let's hook up and throw down. But yet, God's word says something completely different. So even as believers, we have to look at this and say, what's the application here? So you can see, even today, this massive thing that's going to happen in the future is playing out in front of us. Can you see that? Look across our land. We're going to go real world right now in, in our nation alone. Would you say that we are harmonious right now? No, if we're going to complain, and if we're going to argue, and if we're going to war against each other, it's over really big and weird stuff. Like, we're not, now we're arguing about, I think it's kind of moving off of this now, but we argued about gender. We argued about equality and equity. We're arguing about energy costs. We're arguing about what to do with COVID. We're arguing about good grief, everything. I think if we could argue about the color of blue, we would probably figure that out. There's zero peace across the land. And if you rewind five years, just five years, the stuff that we're arguing about five years ago, you'd be like, no way, we're not going to we're not going to get bent out of shape about that. How about how about weird stuff like. Even 10 years ago. If you would have come to me and said, hey, in uh, elementary school, we're going to teach kids how to transition. I would have 
I would have literally vomited all over you. I'd have been like, what are you talking about? That will never happen in the United States. How about the war on the unborn? How about, hey, let's just destroy an entire class of people just because we don't agree with them. All of this, 10 years ago, five years ago, I'd have been like, you're crazy. We'll never get there. This nation's too good about that. That's not the case today. We are literally blowing each other up from the inside. And what I see in Scripture right here is the, the culmination, the crescendo. I'm not even musical, and I know what crescendo means. This is the end. This is the coup de gras. You see in Scripture where it says, why do the nations rage? Well, we're already doing that right now. And the people plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves. That word set, do you guys know what that means? Yeah, it means to set, right? No. The word set there, any chess players, raise your hand. I got to make sure you guys are still awake. Chess player, Vinny's the only chess player. You're a chess player, good, there you go. Anybody else? Two. Oh my goodness, you guys need to go home, Walmart, Amazon, order yourself some, ah, oh, there we go. All right, we got three. All right, chess is a brilliant game, love it. When you play each piece, when you play each piece, you set in a strategic mindset. When the, when the scripture says, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. What this is, is political leaders posturing for power. It's them setting themselves up. This scripture directly points towards the end time. In Revelation 16, 14 through 16, it says, and they, they're speaking of evils, uh, John is speaking of evil spirits. They are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for battle on the day of the Lord Almighty. Now skip to verse 16. It says, and they gathered the kings together to the place that is in Hebrew called Armageddon. This is, this is building now. The reason why is because what it says right here is, come, let us gather together to burst their bonds. Who's there? Multiple, plural, who's there? Look, if you're a believer, you can raise your hand right there. It's God's bride. It's the church of Christ who, in their mind, is putting bonds on them. Because we are the believers saying, stop it. Why are, we, why are you doing this? The evil rulers of this day are like, enough of this truth stuff. I saw, I saw, I hate Facebook and Instagram, but I saw this interview where this guy was interviewing this college professor and he says, D define for me what truth is. The guy flipped out. He flipped out. Don't use that word. Don't use what word? Truth? He's like, don't use that word. It's offensive. Right now, wrong is celebrated and championed. Whereas good and truth is devoid in our, in our culture. The scriptures right here in Psalm chapter 2, what used to be such a far off distant time, is, is building now. There is no peace now. And we're seeing the, them set themselves up for a massive, massive effort. It absolutely tears me apart to see how unbelievers treat people, but it breaks my heart even more so to watch how believers treat others. The problem is what we like to do is we like to dip our toe in there sometimes. And my caution to us is stop. We have to be different than culture. Because our sin makes us have a different position with God. Do you know what that is? Look, I'm prior, prior service. I was army, and so this makes sense to me. When we sin actively, we are literally the enemies of God. Philippians 3.18 says, For many who I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross. Romans 5.10 says, 
for we were enemies in our sin nature. We are enemies. We are literally enemy combatants. Go back to the battlefield analogy that I opened with. It's like we have the guns and our sin is blinding us so bad, we're the ones pulling the trigger at God. James 4.4 4 says, You adulterers, do you not know that the friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Hostility, we are actively hostile towards God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be friends with the world makes himself an enemy of God. I can't be pursuing the lusts of the flesh. I can't be outside of the Spirit of God and lie to myself and say, yeah, me and Jesus, we'd be mates. You can't, you can't. They're, they're incongruent. They don't go together. What the wor word is saying here is we are literally trying to shoot God. With all that we have. I'm thinking of this. It's like even as believers. Like I said. We dip, dip our toe in here sometimes. We like the things of the, of the world. We like it. It, it. Sinning is fun. If you're not. If it's not fun. You're doing it wrong. Seriously. But the problem that, that I got here. Is we justify the little ones. Like envy. Lust. Guys. Worry. Like, I'm hitting both genders here, right? This is not just for one class of people. We all, we're, we're okay with those because nobody knows that those exist. But, but they're here, right? But it's just like Adam. You, you know, you ever hear that? And I, I'm sorry, parents, forgive me for this. I got to say this. You ever hear that? There is no such thing as a dumb question. Eh, there's dumb comments all the time. And it's like right here in, in, in Genesis, right after Adam and Eve sinned, what did he do? He goes and sows fig leaves on his, his waist, and he's hiding from God. And God walks through the garden. He says, Adam, where are you? It's not like he didn't know where Adam was. He knew exactly where Adam was and what he had done. And Adam, actually, the dumbest thing, I swear, he says, I hid myself from you because I was naked. Yeah, who made you, bonehead? Seriously, you're not hiding from God, right? And even as a believer... My challenge to you is the lust that's only in here, mm, that's still there. We have to deal with that, right? The envy, the worry. Brings me to point number two. Our sin causes a, di a divine response. Oh, God responds. <laughs> you know, uh, all right, this is a hard one right here, right? If you think that God winks winks, and is chill with the white lies, the envy, the lust, the things that you don't think are a big deal, if you think that, you need to restart reading your Bible. That's not God, the God of the text. He doesn't wink at stuff like that. Everything, everything matters to God. And, it, and it, it'll garner a response. So in Psalms 2, 4 through 6, it says, He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds, those, holds them in derision. Then he will speak of them or to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, on my holy hill. Oh my goodness. That, that scripture right there is packed full of cool things. First of all, all right, so I have three sons, one of which is here today. And it, you can't share this with your brother. Okay, I have three sons. And when they were younger, what they would do is they said, Dad, we want to get into karate. And I'm like, yeah, that's a fad. That'll fall out. It won't happen. Yeah, all three of them get into karate. I'm like, uh-oh, that's expensive. So we go through karate, and my boys are coming home. And they're like, Dad, we just learned this. We want to try it out. And before I get emails about masculinity, just, just save it. You guys just keep it. I let my boys wrestle. I let my boys fight it out in a good, controlled setting. And when they came home, we fought it out. Mama comes running downstairs. What is this ruckus? We're in a full-blown battle royale. We're doing, we're doing all the moves that we learned. And when they were little, it was pretty cool because it was just me versus three. Actually, the little one I'd put over 
I'd put him right here, and then the big ones would attack me, and my job was to protect the little one. As, as the little one got bigger, it was all three versus me. And it was awesome because my boys were taking their masculinity, and they were bumping up against the ceiling. I was giving them the opportunity to battle it out as young men, and it's okay to be men. And it's okay to raise boys that have masculinity. And I was like, man, I'm all into this. Boys, let's go. And then something starts to usually happen. <laughs> the little one gets hurt, always. Poor kid. He's going to be on somebody's couch someday. <laughs> Anyways. So the little one gets a bloody nose or something, whatever. It's not that big a deal. It gets a scratch, and he starts freaking out. And then I start to see something. What used to be like this goes like this. And I'm like, whoa, 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 we're done. We're done. When the emotions start to get out of control and I start to see rebellion, anger, and the things that are not godly masculinity, it's on me to shut it down, and I do. And my boys learn from a very early age when dad shuts us down, it's down. We ain't getting back up. We're done. It's time to go to our separate rooms and chill for a bit. That story plays out in front of my face right here, but it takes a whole different ending. We see a rebellious group of children warring against God, constantly against God, picking up the guns against God. And we don't see a benevolent situation here. What we see is God laughing at them. Imagine the damage that I would have caused as, as a father laughing at my children when they were upset. God laughs at this. Which is a testimony to us believers. God is above it. It doesn't, this is not news to him. Like, oh dang, I better come up with an idea for this. God laughs at it. But as this massive army is getting together to do battle against God... This is really interesting. Does God give the response that they're expecting? No, he doesn't. He gives a weird response. Even for believers, when you read this, you're like, God, I don't get it. Why did you say this? He says, as for me, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, on my holy hill. See, instead of even showing up to the battle, instead of that, he says this. I, I bet these guys are like, God, that's not even an answer. What, what? Well, they're not even paying attention to him. But that's not even, that's a non-answer. We were expecting you to show up. We put in the phone call, show up, it's go it, we're going. Instead, God says, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, on the holy hill. Okay, we got to break that down. We got to figure out what in the world, God, that is so weird. Why would you do that? Brings me to point number three. God promises an answer. You guys ready for this? Two of the big words. God promises an answer. Access and peace. Access and peace. So verse six leads into verse, verses seven through nine. He, it continues, it says, as for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And then he goes into this. I will tell of a decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to, to pieces like a potter's vessel. God's decree is Jesus. So often we read those scriptures and we're like, oh, are they talking about David? No, 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 no. That is Christ. What is on that holy hill is his king. His king is his son, Jesus Christ. If you want further proof, go to, you, we're not, we don't have, to go, have time to go there, but Matthew 17, 5, Acts 13, 33, Hebrews 1, 5, all point to, the, they quote, Psalms chapter 2, in reference to Christ, what's on that hill is Christ. We have access and peace. 
through what's on that hill. Hebrews 1, 3 through 4 says, He is the radiance and the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Hey, you want to know what God looks like and acts like and is like? It's, it points to Jesus. Start there. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The word is Christ. After making the purifications of sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. He, on that hill, is the righteous and perfect judge that will weigh every single sin of non-believer and believer alike. What is on that hill is the peace that the enemies are railing against. How is this move of putting Jesus in the middle of the conflict the answer? Check this out. The very source of all their all this vile anger and hatred is the only source of salvation. Every single one that is picking their guns up and shooting are actually shooting at the only source of salvation. When I read this, it's like, oh my gosh, you, you don't understand. The, they're fighting against the loving offering of the Father. Do you see this? Somebody just do this, just somebody, just one person. I know it's hot. Stay with me. That blew my mind because we rail as non-believers. We rail, we rail against the only source of salvation that we have, and we're angry we have hatred towards it. What causes that hatred is what is blinding us is our sin and our depravity. Romans 5, 1 is, look, go, go to there, go to there. Romans 5, 1, there's, there's two verses I want you to actually read with your own eyes. Romans 5, 1 through 2. If you have the app, the, the version app, go there. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This is where the whole sermon is now going to shift. Pay attention to this. Here's the big point, and if I would have put this up first, all the believers would have rolled their eyes. They're like, duh. Hey, you know what? This is the big point right here. We have peace with God through the cross of Jesus. I know, earth-shattering, right? Look, we have peace through what is on that holy hill when God says, I will put my king right there. Begs the question, why? God, do you talk about wrath here? So uh, one of my sons came to me, and we have great discussions. One of them was like, Dad, well, I have a lot of friends that ask two questions. The first one is, why do bad things happen to good people? That one's a great one. Love that question, because it opens the door. The second one is akin to it. Why does God have to have wrath? Well, I'm glad you guys asked. Are you ready for this? This is from Jonathan Edwards, an icon of theology. He says, wrath of God serves to remind people that God wishes their best and is willing to take physical action to inhibit the self-destructiveness of human rebellion. Said another way, God's wrath is the twin to God's mercy. Mercy without correction is mere permission. And mere permission never has the interest of the person in mind. God's wrath then is God's mercy. Does that make sense? You can't have a, a loving father without him kicking you in the tail sometimes. Look, my boys are, are corrected at home. Because I love them. If I didn't love them, I'd let them be knuckleheads. But I'm going to keep them in check. But God here even takes a good father, and it's like 
crack cocaine here. God is truly into the preservation of his children. Why does God have wrath? Because he's holy. How many times does the Bible say holy as a description of God? Three times. God is holy, holy, holy. But we forget about that and we like this whole God is love thing because you think that when, he's, when you think God is love, it gives you permission to act like the world. We forget about the holy part. The holy part keeps you in check because he's the one that will straighten you out. Now, he is love, but the wrath and the love are married. I hear it all the time, 15 years of ministry, and people ask about that. The other scripture verse I would really love for you to go to is 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5. See who's fast. 2 Corinthians 5. If you got there, give me a nod, something. Give me a wave. I know it's hot. Stay with me. Woo, got one. All right. 2 Corinthians 5. I love, love these scriptures. We're going to start in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, I didn't say out of Christ. I didn't say doing it on my own. I didn't say any of that garbage. I'm saying, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, here's the money, the money, money, money verse. All this is from God. It's not me trying to put on a bigger set of boots to try to be better. I'm not going to ever be in Christ on my own efforts. It's the person and work of Christ and Christ alone. All this is from God. Who, through Christ, not through me, through Christ, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, so I hear this all the time, especially in youth ministry. Hey, how do you know you're saved? Well, I asked Jesus to save me from my sin. Okay, I'm going to blow some long-term believers out of the water. You ready for this? You ready for this? Christ didn't come to save you from your sins. He came to save you from the justified wrath that you deserve, that I deserve. The wrath of God is intended for the rebellion of sin. The church has a really big, old, long name for it. It's called substitutionary atonement. He is the substitute on the cross for me. Thank God. Somebody give me an amen. Praise be to Jesus that on that holy hill in Zion, there was a Savior that stretched himself out. There was a Savior who said, no, I'm going to take that wrath. It should be me on that cross. It should be you on that cross. I hate to say it. This is a hard statement, a hard teaching. But praise be to Jesus that he has, subs he has been the substitutional lamb. Man, I get fired up about that. Because of who's on that cross, we now have access. That word access is such a cool word. Access is a personal invite from a superior being. I don't have access to God apart from Christ. I thought about all these different kinds of analogies. I don't have time to tell them. Just hear me say this. A superior being is literally covering you. Way superior. One man covers the sin of every generation from beginning of time. That's pretty superior. Praise be to Jesus that we have access. All right, now, this is for the believer. You ready for this? In John chapter 14, verse 27, there's a promise for believers. Here's another hard statement. If you're not a believer in Christ, if you're not in Christ, this promise is not for you. This is Jesus talking to his disciples before his ascension. This is one of the most profound statements from our Lord. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you to you. Let not your hearts be tro troubled, neither let them be afraid. That word give in the, in the Greek is 
didomenoi, and I blew it. It's D-I-D-O-M-I. It means to give or to offer. Now check this out. In the in general word of get for giving, in a sacrificial context. Did you catch that? Jesus, this word is a huge word. It isn't like, hey, I gave you a hundred bucks. Actually, that's a lot of bucks. I didn't give you just five bucks, and it was like, eh. This is a sacrificial context. He's literally sacrificing his peace to his to the believers. It can refer to the presentation of an offering. He's giving an offering of peace. He's offering this to you. That's a huge rev- revelation to me. The, look at the completeness of that. It isn't like, hey, I'm going to give you five bucks, and I expect you to give me five bucks. No, 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 no. It's 100% all in. He gives you our peace. Now, here's the application. I gave this sermon to my wife, and she's like, uh, okay, you're pretty hard on people. I'm like, okay, all right. Check this out. From a believer's perspective, in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, that peace, what does that look like to you? Well, let me, let me give you a story. And as the worship team comes on, come, come on up, this white flag is actually symbolic of something pretty big. So every time I talk about my kids, I get emotional. So if you don't have kids and you're like, oh, my gosh, people cry about kids all the time. You know what? I can't wait for you to have kids. You're going to cry like a useless baby. And then come back and tell me about that. Anyways. <laughs> My middle son, um, sorry, Nate, you're even here today. I didn't think you were going to be. My middle son, at ages three, four, five, we spent every Christmas in the same stupid location. It was the ER. Every week before Christmas, my kid would turn blue. And we didn't know what was going on. Have you ever gone into your child's room and literally listened for every breath? Literally, every breath. And it only happened at night. I remember saying to Heidi, that was a good breath, my wife. That was a good one. We literally thought we were going to lose our kid. And I had heard, I had heard that you could take the kid outside and the cold will actually open their lungs. I remember running outside with my son and holding him, praying, God, open his lungs. We went to the ER and the doctors had no idea, no idea what was going on. For three years, we were like, what in the world? You know what? Three years later, we found out he had cold-induced asthma. But during the worst phase of that, the worst phase of that, I was the one freaking out, the pastor. I was the one crying out to God, are you going to take my son? He's four. Spirit rested on my wife and said, do you trust me with him? Heidi comes to me and she goes, Vaughn, I feel like God's telling us to rest in his peace. I'm the pastor. I'm supposed to have that. Our peace that we get from the Holy One on this hill transcends everything. Listen, maybe you're here today and you're, you're on that battlefield. And you have your guns drawn. Maybe it's time. Put it down. I'm not begging you. I'm telling you. The end of Psalms chapter 2 says he will rule with an iron fist. He will crush the rebellion like a potter on dry clay. Every knee, every tongue will profess Jesus Christ as Lord. I would much rather do do it now than when I'm being crushed. Why wait? Grab the white flag. Say, God, I surrender. I want your peace.
Let's go to the Lord in prayer.